Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast. This is Bruce Hutchin, host and executive producer. Each week, you will hear tips, techniques, strategies, and personal stories from some of the best and funniest whitetail hunters in North America. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you do, tell a friend on social media. If not, tell me and I'll make it better. Thanks for listening, folks. Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast, episode number 387. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, Bruce Hutchin, and uh, I'm the host and executive producer now. I, I got a, I got a, a title raise. <laughs> That's a joke, folks. I've been doing both, and I just call myself an executive producer now. So we're going to head down to Texas, in north central Texas, and Matt Gray. And Matt, um, a heck of a uh, whitetail hunter down there in Texas. He's got a great story he's going to share. And then he's going to, we're going to kind of head my way out to Colorado because he had a great first time experience out here. So Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, um, Matt, let's just start off, uh, that magnificent buck that you shot. Um, let's tell the story about it. Sure. Let's say I was, um, uh, that happened when I was 12 years old. I uh, had the opportunity to go along on what was supposed to be a management deer hunt um, at uh, a property out in like West Central Texas and a uh, very large uh, cattle ranch. Um, and w- they took a few of us kids out there and we were uh, allowed to shoot the eight points and they said the bigger the better and it could have one kicker. And uh, last day, believe it or not, we hunted for let's see, I think four days straight. And on the last day, last morning, um, I was getting ready to shoot a spike, uh, because we just hadn't seen anything that fit the bill. And I was literally turning to go to reach for my rifle and looked out the other side of the, of the blind and saw this, uh, monster deer, um, about 50 yards behind the blind and I, we pulled up the binoculars and I just kept praying, please be eight points, please be eight points. And, and we watched it for a while and we count, we made sure it had eight points and it had one kicker and I pulled the trigger and, and I got to shoot a one heck of a deer when I was only 12 years old. So I still haven't seen anything as big as him free range since. So. Yeah, I was going to ask you, were you up, uh, on a preserve, high fence, or, or free range, and you just answered that question. Yeah. Now, how did you hunt? You're 12 years old. Were you hunting with your dad, your uncle, or tell me about the hunting uh, tradition that was involved. Well, sure. I, I, shoot, I think my dad had me in a deer stand when I was even a little baby. I'd be going out with him. Uh, I shot my first deer uh, when I was six years old with a rifle, and... Uh, and man, hunted ever since. Uh, we'd spent almost every weekend I, that I can remember when I was little going to a deer lease or going to somebody's property to go deer or pig hunting or spring turkey hunting. And um, but on that hunt, um, it was me and my dad, it, and it was with a rifle. And I had just started bow hunting um, that season. We in, in Texas, October is our our bow season and then we get a at the end of october is a youth weekend for rifle hunting and then november starts the rifle season and and i had already shot my first doe with a bow um about two weeks before i had shot that big buck and believe it or not i was more nervous to shoot that doe with a bow at 12 yards than i was even pulling the trigger in that on that huge whitetail uh with a gun and and I can't even remember the last animal now that I've taken with a with a rifle. I just I just got hooked, so I've been bow hunting ever since. Oh, you but. said um, you started off with your dad as a young, a real young kid in the in the um, in the blind. Now, what did your father teach you when you're you know that young that you've carried on to today? Oh, yeah, everything about whitetails, how they move, how uh, even say like walking through the woods or walking to the stand that that humans typically walk in different cadences than a whitetail. So if you just were to head, like say you head off straight to your blind and don't stop there in between, and an animal hears you in the woods, they're going to know that is not a deer coming towards them because deer stop every once in a while. They check things out. They um, 
He taught me about the rut. He taught me about life. <laughs> you know, everything happened. Uh, taught me about faith in a deer blind. So it was definitely many, many, many hours spent uh, father son time in a deer blind somewhere. So. Well, thanks for sharing that. Now, I, I see that um, in your bio, you sent uh, uh, your Pope and Young, your second Pope and Young archery buck and back in 208. What's the story on that buck? Oh, gosh. Let's see. That deer, um, that was on a, a small property um, out in Mason County. Um, and it was a couple hundred acre place that I had permission to. Hunt. Me and my dad went out there a lot. We had a good relationship with the owner, and and uh, we, you know, do some work for him. And and he let us go out there and hunt every once in a while, and let me set up my own stand and everything. And and he was a, uh, um, let's see, he came in. I was setting up over a over a road. I knew he was coming to, and he came in about. Let's see, he was thirty five yards away which for Texas bow hunting is an incredibly far shot. Uh, they're just wound up really, really, really tight. It's hard to connect with anything much more than 20, 25 yards. But uh, uh, so, yeah, that one, I think that was when I was 15 or 16 years old. So. So what makes you such a good hunter? Uh, lots of mistakes. <laughs> uh, I spent a, you know, a lot of time in the woods as a kid. And, and now I did get away from it for a while in college. I got into roping and rodeo and, and uh, team roping specifically and things, but I think it's just messing up enough. You start to learn, to, uh, learn what to do. And, and I always had great bow hunters around me teaching me things, but man, when you get up in a stand and you start having something move in on you um, and the nerves start coming in, you forget everything you were told. And you just got to make your own mistakes again. At least that's the way it was with me. And then I remember right after something happened that, uh, um, uh, that oh, yeah, so-and-so told me that I shouldn't do that or I should have drawn before this moment or, or uh, whichever. But just yeah, spending time out there for a long time now has been the secret. So, nope. We got listeners all across North America. So what's one, your, pardon me, your one big thing about whitetail hunting you want to share with them? Well, I would say over the last um, three or four years, I've mostly been hunting very small acreage properties, um, less than 100, uh, sometimes even just 20. And I've learned that it's, it's stand placement is critical if you want to keep uh, animals there um, all year round, you know, Texas, we're allowed to use feeders. I try to keep a feeder going all the way through the summer. And I want it to throw in the middle of the night. Cause I've learned that big bucks like to, they're pretty much nocturnal here in the summer and they'll stay on your property. If you put food out for them at night and maybe they'll still be there come season. Um, I've also learned that no matter how good an area looks or how full of rubs it is or sheds that you need to have somewhere on your property that is a sanctuary for them and you need to hunt just outside of it and if especially on small acres if you push into areas like that you're going to push them away and not have much to look at the whole season that's interesting because you just hit upon two things you know if you're going to hunt mature bucks um they got to feel safe Absolutely. someplace you know, on, on that acreage. So do you, did you create a sanctuary by hinge cutting or, or, or plowing or toppling trees or, you know, with a backhoe or how'd you do it? Um, well, I would say like said, for this area of Texas, there's a lot of cattle, um, and a lot of people manage their properties for cattle. So they like to clear everything off, make everything nice, pretty hay fields. And so I would say like their habitat, if you find that if you have access to a property that still is covered in woods, um, that for the most part does it. Um, it's just a place that they feel comfortable and especially moving in between all of these bigger open fields. Um, I've tried, 
let's see, last year I planted a small little food plot just by hand, just hand raked it and did some things like that. And I, and I, and this is where I learned this. I tried hunting it in the beginning of the season and, and learned that I just, I was just pushing everything away and I didn't really see anything till I stayed out of that place for about three weeks and came back a couple hundred yards away from it. And I started seeing deer as they moved towards it. Um, and they started coming back on the property. So you, you think about that, and one thing you said, if you didn't pressure the deer, you held them on your property, and you use your feeders at night. Yep. How did you, how did you uncover that? Uh, uncover the, how, that the, how to keep them there? Yeah, how to keep them there, because you decided, wait a minute, the bucks are active at night, so I'm going to only kick my feeders on at night. I learned that a long time ago. Uh, me and my dad had a, a group deer lease on a, a large property, and I think there was 11 different hunters on it, and everybody kind of had their own little area. And there was this one older man. Uh, he's passed away now, but he, out of everybody, he consistently shot bucks that were easily 30 or 40 inches bigger than anything else anybody, all the rest of us, would take off the property. and. Uh, we finally, I got him to tell me, you know, what, what he was doing to keep all the big bucks over on his spot. And he said all summer long, he kept, he would turn it, let his feeder go off for a few seconds and throw some corn out in the middle of the night. He even kept it doing that during hunting season. So he could try to keep those bachelor buck, bucks close by. And then he would just hope that when he was there hunting during the day, that they'd be close somewhere sleeping. And then a hot doe would come strolling through and you know, get them to stand up and do something they normally wouldn't and present a shot opportunity. And he consistently shot 160 to 170 inch, I think even one, a once a 180 inch deer off a place that I rarely saw something bigger than 130. Um, so he had it figured out, didn't he? He did. He did. That's, that's great. Now, do you um, use feeders on your Texas properties or do you um, have micro plots or you know how do you how do you give them food so i use feeders uh and i will say too that it it's hard not to just the way everything is in texas um the way the land is the the, the sheer number of deer here if you want to um and if you want to be able to manage your property the best that you can majority of the times you're in a situation where you need to shoot more deer than you even have the possibility to. Um, so you need, if you put out feeders, some people might say, oh, that's cheating or it's making it too easy. But if you hunt a feeder, you get to select the animal you harvest much easier than when you don't hunt over a feeder. I've learned that when I'm not hunting over a feeder, I'm less picky on the animals I'll shoot. If I see a buck that maybe wasn't on my list before and I'm a, I'm a little bit more tempted to take a shot just because it's a shot opportunity. When if you have a feeder, um, you get to watch the deer longer. You get to really figure out their age, what they're doing. Um, you get to see things you normally wouldn't see if you just saw them for a split second walking down a trail, you know, every once in a while. So at Texas hunting over feeders, it's, I know there's some people that can do without it, but it's, it's pretty vital to consistently um, take animals. And, and also I'll say over the last few years, my priority when it comes to whitetail hunting has changed from trying to shoot really large deer um, to just trying to fill the freezer every year. Uh, that's pretty much all the meat we eat each year is, is a whitetail. And luckily last year we got to put an elk in there. And uh, so I'm definitely concerned with, filling my five tags i'm allowed so and thanks for that and how matt how would people get a hold of you if they want to reach you out, out to you on social media oh uh, sure we got uh, my elk hunting partner and i um isaac we have a little facebook page called the regular hunters with matt and isaac it, it, we're not fancy we don't have a bunch of cameras and we're not going to be posting stuff all the time but we like to make a lot of our own gear and we put that on there if we've done something we think people that would be interested in that are just regular guys like us that don't have a bunch of money to spend on fancy hunting gear, we'll throw it on there. 
And if people want to see how we do through the hunting season, you know, we definitely put our hunting pictures on there and pictures of shooting bows and, and guns with our kids and things like that. So yeah, it's uh, the regular hunters with Matt and Isaac. Thanks for that. And Hey, right now I've got, um, coming up after, after Matt's show, I've got a recording with Jesse Paulson from wilderness athlete and, uh, fit the hunt Nicholas, uh, lap. And, um, I just want to give them a shout out. I'm excited to have him on the show. And, uh, and I wish my good friend, uh, Brian Ritchie over at moon stands, um, uh, great success with his his new product. If you haven't checked out Moon Stands, why don't you go ahead and do it? And finally, Rack Algae, uh, Jason Obermiller and Eric Fitzgerald up in Nebraska has got some great insight um, into um, what it takes to, to grow deer and the nutrition that they need. So um, their show's coming up here in, in a couple of months. So having said that, uh, let's do a transition now because how I get a hold of Matt was um, with Steve and Lenny over at Echo Mountain Gear, and uh, I saw that um, Matt had had a um, podcast with him, so I got in touch with those guys, and um, and we get we got connected with Matt, and here he is because uh, he's going to share some information about uh, West Texas boy coming out to Colorado and mixing it up with elk and uh, the lessons learned. So. Let's jump into it. Why did you and your hunting partner decide to head west? Oh, man, I, I, I got the bug, I think, in 2014. Um, I was talking to a friend that, that had been spending a few years going out there, and, and uh, man, I, grew up, I grew up thinking that you either had to have a lot of money or draw some really special tag to get to go uh, hunting out west, especially hunting elk. I had no idea it was something you could do yourself and for not that much money and uh so i i started planning it for my 2016 trip shoot i believe in 2013 and i talked to as many people as i could watch as many videos as i could listen to podcasts and and i would try to get some gear together say i'm gonna go that year and then i say oh i just can't manage it this year i got too much going on and finally i said september 2016 i don't care what kind of gear i have or don't have I'm driving to Colorado and I found a partner just a, a good partner about six months before that and I said hey this is short notice but you, would you want to go and he said heck yes and we headed out there <laughs> so let's talk about and, and frame this uh, this part of the show uh, about lessons that you learned whitetail hunting that you transferred into um a successful elk hunt and and one thing listeners to go diy first time into an area you've never been and one see elk hear elk spend time with elk uh it is is success in itself if you never never got a shot now matt did did it one better so let's talk about how whitetail hunting uh gave you the um ability to be successful on your first uh, DIY elk hunt? Well, I guess I learned that um, elk like their spots, at least for, you know, I was hunting in Colorado and, and real high country areas, and I learned that, that the elk were not everywhere. They had their spots that they liked to be, and until something else moved them away, and I realized that was very similar to whitetails. I knew they needed food, shelter, um, and water, and they needed to be safe from hunting pressure. Um, so I looked for those similar things, you know, a little bit different being up in the mountains and being a different animal, but it, it still was a lot of the same tactic to try to find areas that would hold elk. And lo and behold, my first spot that I, my, my number one spot last year, I said, I really think this spot is going to hold elk. And it did. Um, I know this is probably unheard of for most over-the-counter units, but our first night staying back in there, we backpacked in, and we couldn't sleep that night because there were so many bugles. <laughs> like it was, it was truly unreal, and I knew I was very lucky to find that on my first um, over-the-counter archery trip out west. So, how did you find that spot? Uh, Google Earth. I um, definitely was all over Google Earth and. Uh, I learned from forums and things how to overlay, you know, like the unit maps onto them, topo maps. 
uh, biggest thing is I did is I would, I tried to get, I stayed away from roads and I looked for terrain features that would separate majority of hunters or maybe the hunter access points from an area that elk might want to be. And if that area was away, separated from hunters, either by distance or by some sort of terrain feature, like a really, really steep um, and tall elevation increase real quick. And then there was some area right up above there that I could tell had food and water and cover. Uh, I knew that it was going to hold elk. I also looked for areas that had escape routes. So, in fact, the area that I shot my bull, even though we hiked a ways in, was not in a wilderness area. But I knew that, uh, and it also bordered private land, so I knew that it might hold elk there because if the hunting pressure did get in there and increase it, they could either head off in the wilderness area or they could head off into private land to get away from it. So I knew they would feel comfortable being in that area. So, yeah, you have some, you know, as, as I told you in the warm up, and we're going to go to that subject, you get some great insight. So, how do you figure the 90 10 rule? Oh, I learned that was, I did not know that until I got back from my hunt last year. And, and you know, halfway through the trip, uh, um, I got to fill my tag. I shot a, a, a little four point bull um, on the third day, and we still had four days left. And we decided a, a day or two after I shot mine out of that spot, some other hunters had moved in. And like, just like I said, the elk did move off into private land. And, uh, and so we went to some of the other spots I had on my list and we didn't see a single elk the whole rest of the trip. And so driving home, the 12 hour drive back to central Texas. And, and then the weeks after just trying to sit there and digest all the information that we learned from that trip, we started you know, kind of putting lists together in our head of why was it that there was elk there and nowhere else? And so that's when I, I, and I've heard of the nine. Hey, Matt, we were talking about the 90, 10 rule and, you know, you're sharing your, on your 12 hour drive home with Isaac, you you were figuring things out. Now let's get back to that and, and expand upon that more. So what 90, 10 means to you now? Sure. So, um, it means that 90 per, 90% of the elk, um, in any given unit, I feel like is, are, are going to be in only 10% of the country, you know, and very similar to how a lot of people have heard that 90% of the elk that are harvested each year are harvested by 10% of the elk hunters. That's another one of our goals is we said, Hey, we know we've never done this before, but we want to be that 10% that kills an elk every year. And what do we got to do? to be there and, and probably the most important thing for that was also learning the 90 10 rule in terms of where elk like to live and so we didn't we try not to wait this next year we're not going to waste any time in areas that we aren't seeing elk even if they're signed there they might have moved off somewhere else we want to hear them and we want to see them and and we're going to keep moving until we find a spot like that and listeners that's key because um what are the three things that whitetails need, Matt? Food, food, water, and shelter, and cover. And what are the five things that elk need? Food, water, um, cover, and then I guess in September would be um, females. <laughs> <laughs> and escape routes. And escape routes, yes, that's right. Okay, so, you know, whitetail hunters, um, you, you already know three of them really well, um, food, cover, you know, and shelter. Um, escape routes, maybe, maybe not, because they live on 40 acres, 120 acres, 200 acres, 500 acres, so they, they sort of know where they're at. But elk are, are, are different critters, and, um, you know, they got to eat every day, they got to water every day, and they got to sleep every day. And they can do that within three to five miles of where you might see them. Now, escape routes, that's where the terrain comes in. Let's talk about Google Earth and, and topo maps and, and figuring out the terrain that would enable an elk to escape a specific area. Uh, absolutely. So, well, a good example of this is my cousin is planning on making the same trip I did last year out west. And, and he's been trying to figure out where he wants to go and 
and he'll, I told him I'd help him, um, with my input on, you know, where might hold elk in the units that he's looking at. And so he might send me a unit number and I'll start looking at it on Google earth. And I got my different overlays on there. I got topos. I can go back and forth and I can look for these areas that I look for, um, you know, I look for tree line way up at tree line as high as I can get um, areas that are surrounded by a lot of rugged terrain, but maybe have small areas that open up to less steep terrain that um, have meadows in them. You can see water, you can see lots of cover, you can see lots of green. And then when I go back and forth with the topo, I can determine how far they are away from roads. And they don't necessarily, everybody talks about how you got to be far away from roads. You don't have to be that far away from the roads. You just have to, elk are going to be in a place that is, what I would say, separated from roads, from other hunters. Uh, shoot, where I killed my bull last year, as a crow flies, it was probably only a mile away from an extremely popular trailhead. There was trucks all over the place. But everybody was either trying to go way far deep in as they could or going the other direction. But nobody said, hey, there's a really steep hill right there. I wonder what's on top. And we went on top and we were in a mess of elk. And we were only a mile away from a road and a, uh, about 100 trucks. <laughs> so, And uh, with my cousin with that example so he gave me this unit i i told him i said hey i would go to this spot you're going to have to hike in about two miles this area's got everything they'd want it's away from hunting pressure it's over a ridge from where majority of the hunters are going to be uh, where the roads come in so i bet 90 percent of your hunters are not going to go over that ridge so if you go over there i bet you'll be in a mess of elk and then I said, but if there's some other hunters that are crazy enough to hike all the way in there, like like him and I are, then I know that there's wilderness area to the north of that that is really far away from roads. And I said, I, I bet as pressure builds, those elk are going to move north. And so that's what my game plan would be for him is to go to go to that spot and then pay attention to where the elk going to move if more hunters come in here. And as other hunters get in there and start scratching their heads and think what happened to all the elk, you have a game plan of where they went. Spinning it back to whitetail hunting, you know, when they bust a, uh, a, um, a buck, you, you sort of kind of know where he's headed because you're familiar. You're just so familiar. And that's the challenge of hunting out West. It takes a long time just to get comfortable. I, you know, I've heard it told, you know, takes three years to learn a, a specific area that that you can hunt that's h hiking um less than 10 miles 10 miles a day and there's guys out here and guys from all over the country that will put you know five to ten miles on their boots just trying to find just trying to find elk so if you've heard what matt said he he figured it out really well uh he analyzed it. He said, what am I looking for? Then look for those properties and terrain, um, physical barriers. Could be could be a river. Elk will swim rivers, but um, hunters won't, um, especially in the fall. And you, you throw all this in. And so Matt figured it out very early because um, he was successful. Um, you know, he, he just got it done. One thing I, that perplexes me. Um, I've always been told, you know, don't camp where the elk are. It, 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 you are right on top of them. Oh, oh, yeah. Did you light a fire? You jet boils? How'd you eat? So we didn't, we didn't light a fire. Uh, we, uh, we used jet boils. Um, what we did is we found this, we went into this spot, hiked in there, and uh, it was about, yeah, three and a half, four miles from where we parked the truck. Heard bugling that morning tried to hunt it and didn't have any luck. I think we just, we pushed the elk kind of down the hill. Um, and we hiked back out of there and just, that was hard enough. We came back to the truck. We said, you know what? We can't do this every day. Let's get some of our stuff to stay back there. And the next afternoon we hiked in there to stay for a few days. We got in there right before dark. Um, 
And I think it just, a lot of it was, the timing was perfect. As we started moving our way down into this little basin, the elk had started moving their way down right as it was getting dark out of where we were. I think they were bedding close to where we um, set up our camp. We set up the camp, we're real quiet. We whispered to each other, um, tried to go to sleep. And next thing we know, the bugle started and they started <laughs> moving up the mountain all around us. I bet the... Uh, Two different times we had a bull within 50 yards of us sitting there just sloshing in the mud. You could hear him stepping and they'd be raking trees. Like there was many moments where I was literally worried that uh, uh, how my little tarp shelter tent that I, I made myself, how it would hold up if an elk ran over it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it just seemed like the, um, I don't know, maybe they didn't, they weren't as concerned. Maybe they knew they were safe at night. Uh, nothing would happen to them. They they did not care that we were there. And and I will say this: people are going to hate it when I say this. I shot my bull about thirty yards from where my tent was, and uh, the bull that had been bugling by us all night had moved about two hundred yards up this ridge. And I was trying to get up to him. I knew he was he was big. We never actually laid eyes on him, but every time he'd bugle, more cows would just come out of the woodwork and start heading their way to go bed with him right after daylight. And I got pinned down by these cows and I couldn't move up there. And next thing I know, some cows come walking up um, this little trail right by me and I see some horns behind them. I draw back my bow and, and these two cows lead this little um, four point up the hill and, and right towards me. And I'm sitting there counting horns and I said, yep, he's legal. And he was about eight yards from me when I shot him and uh, only went about 50 yards. And yeah, I, I took that shot only about 30 yards from my tent. <laughs> so I, I would not be worried about as long as you're not loud, you don't have a fire about um, spending the night with the elk. Uh, and that, that makes me think of something else I think is vital. I did not realize this on my hunt until afterwards. And I realized that is absolutely true. As I heard Dan Staten over at Elk Shape, I heard him, somebody asked him, you know, how do you locate elk? And he says, he does not sleep until he finds elk. And if the elk are staying up all night and they're bugling all night, then that's what he's going to do. And he's going to sleep in the day. And I learned where we were. Yes, there was hunting pressure. We were away from most of it. But the elk, as soon as that sun came up, there was nothing. You didn't hear anything and you didn't see anything. So we also learned that, at least in the area we were in, where there was a lot of pressure, that when we go back next year, if the elk are not talking during the daytime, then we're not going to expect them to. Then we're going to sleep then, and we're going to move around at night the best we can and find them when they're talking. Uh, it's it's pretty hard to find elk when they're not talking to you. <laughs> so, Yeah, one thing on that, this, you know, for what it's worth, folks, um, archery hunting, I used to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And, um, and I'd go out and I'd get the high ridges so I could see as soon as the sun broke, I could see, but if I was in the right area, I could hear elk, um, mewing and just being elk and bugles and all that. And then what I would do, I, I wouldn't hunt them. I just back out cause I'd, I'd watch them go into the timber or wherever they're going to bed. And then I'd watch them then that evening i go back and go to sleep get up at one o'clock take my shower and go back to where i sort of kind of knew they were check the wind do all the things you got to do and then i drop in on them um to wherever they were and the biggest thing i always started from the top because the thermals during the day are going to go up and over they're not going to slide down so i always came in from the top and if i couldn't get in the top i'd, I'd just go find another herd because i get busted so that brings me to the question so you're sleeping you know yards from from elk and they're moving through you how come they didn't smell you so uh, the the timing of it was perfect we were we camped like right at tree line like just above us there was no more trees and it really honestly got up into almost like sheep looking type country i guess and, and um so when we were there at night our, we know our scent was going straight to them. It was going downhill, but I really think they, they just didn't care. But as soon as that sun came up over the ridge, we were, let's see, we were on the, 
we were on the west side of a ridge. And so as soon as that sun came up and got over and started shining and heating up that hillside, things changed. And if we were on that side of the hill, everything stopped talking. And if you were in that area during uh, when the sun was actually touching that spot, they could tell you were there. Um, so, yeah, I, I ended up being able to be successful. It was before the sun really even was comp- was up over that mountain. Um, and so I was still in the shade of, of the mountain whenever I uh, took my shot and had the opportunity. So my thermals were going downhill and they were coming around the side. But, I, I mean, I really think they just, when it's dark, they are not as on alert as they would be. I know uh, uh, Steve um, with Exo Mountain Gear, I've heard him many times in this, in podcasts. Him and Lenny, they do the same thing. They don't have fires. They're not out there trying to scare stuff away, but they are not afraid to, to camp right in the middle of elk if they find them, as long as they're smart about it. We're getting a lot of uh, good information, and thanks for introducing Steve and Lenny from, uh, from Echo. Make sure I say that. Yeah, Exo Mountain Gear. Exo Mountain Gear, because um, there's a special little story here, and and Matt was able to get on their podcast, podcast number 65. What's their podcast uh, show name? Uh, The Hunt Backcountry Podcast. So if you're thinking about going out west, uh, check them out, The Hunt uh, Backcountry Podcast. And let's talk about um, that relationship and how that all came to be, because uh, this is about – preparation uh for your hunt and and lessons learned so let's jump into that segment and then we'll spend five or ten minutes on that and then we're going to call it a show okay yeah um podcasts like that one like the hunt Bad country podcast and others they're they're gold for somebody like myself that um doesn't live out west doesn't didn't know anything about elk hunting uh or backpack hunting or anything and so it was just great to be either at work or driving in your truck and being able to pretty much have somebody teaching you how to hunt elk and how to camp out there, how to, how to move about the mountains and survive a week <laughs> back there. Um, so if you haven't checked out those podcasts, I would definitely subscribe to them. Um, they are just like this whitetail one. It's um, this is where you learn more than you've ever known before. Uh, it connects us hunters like nothing else before. And, uh, but last year uh, on my, I still had a fantastic time. I was able to, get it pull an elk out of the mountains of Colorado but there was a lot that I did not expect and it is fa- it's it's great to be able to listen to experts who live there and who've done it for a long time tell you how to un elk I wouldn't have been able to, to harvest an elk my first year without that knowledge but for a brand new hunter I felt like it was a or western hunter I felt like there was a lot of things that I wasn't ready for and so I reached out to Mark uh, uh, Mark Huslin there um, running the podcast and I said, Hey, I love the podcast, but you know, I'd love to hear from some first timers like me. I think every time I'm going to go out West and hunt, I'm going to learn something, but I'm never going to learn as much as I did on my first trip. And he said, well, it sounds like you've got a story to tell. Would you mind if I interviewed you? And I said, sure. And one of the first things we talked about is how horrible my pack was. <laughs> I'm not going to mention it, but especially for other first time or mention the brand, but especially for other first timers out there who are looking at some of the prices of some of this Western gear and going, Holy smokes, you know, that's a mortgage payment for a pack. Uh, I got to say that there's a price to pay for everything. And yes, you can go just like I did with a, with a hundred dollar used pack and get the job done and, and get an elk out of the mountains, but you're going to pay for it. It's going to hurt. And, uh, uh, if it doesn't break on you or anything like that. So, uh, uh, Steve was able to get some uh, some beautiful XO 3500 uh, bags in our in our hands, and I've had them for about a month now. Me and my hunting partner, and if you haven't checked out XO Mountain Gear, these bags are these packs are unreal. Uh, the comfort level of them, um, I would even say too, for people who have gone one year and are looking at upgrading things, but still don't want to to spend the money on a on these high end packs like this. If you if you got your boots in order, I think that's the number one thing you have to have. Number one item of gear that has to be working for you and it has to work well is your boots. But second is your pack. And if if you're 
not sure about spending that kind of money. I got to say that it is absolutely worth it. These things, it'll be the last pack you ever bought. They come with lifetime warranties. You know, you can upgrade all the rest of your gear the next year. These packs are truly um, unreal. I've been hiking around or walking around my, my neighborhood constantly with my wife and daughter with a 60 pound sandbag in there trying to get ready for next year. And the comfort level with even with weight is is truly unbelievable and the so definitely give them a uh give them give their website a check so we covered the boots and and i'll just underscore that if you've heard any of my western um friends on the podcast we just did a series for go hunt dot com and you know to to a man and to a woman if you don't have good boots then don't even bother coming out here because if your feet get shot the first day, the, the, the hike in three miles, four miles, whatever it is, then you're done because your body's, you're going to move on your feet. And if you get blisters or, you know, whatever happens to your feet, you won't be able to hunt. So what's, why do you drive 12 hours of fly or buy the tags and do all that stuff when you're not going to be able to hunt? So I can't underscore that. Go find a pair of boots today. If you plan on hunting out west and break them in, if they don't work, bring them back to the store. Now, you know, this is gazillion stores. There's big box stores. I like uh, REI, recreational equipment. Um, when I've been a customer there forever, but all their stuff, if it doesn't fit, I can bring it back and they'll get me something that will. Um, your boots should be, you know, um, stiff and they should be Gore-Tex and they don't have to be, you know, up to your calf, um, but you've got to have good boots and you they've got to be so comfortable that you don't even feel like you have them on. Like, like Matt's walking, you know, uh, he got good boots and now he's got a good frame. So he's got the two most important things. And because without those two things, you can't hunt that country. Then comes your, your archery gear and your water and your compass and your sat phone and your GPS and, you know, jet boils and mountain home. I mean, you know, all the rest of the stuff, if it breaks, you can, you can replace it, but on the mountain, you can't replace your pack or your, um, or your feet. And you got to think safety too, folks. Uh, the mountains can kill you. I know I've, I've spent enough time. I've seen enough lightning strikes and blah, 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 um, to know that. So, you know, where it's a great challenge, you got to be smart and you've got to have a partner. Last thing I'm going to say, you got to have a partner you can count on. I used to DIY hunt on, uh, in places that I was five, 10 miles from the closest person. And I did it by myself. That's, that's what I like to do. I, and just, you know, that's, that's what I like to do when I was younger. Uh, as an older gentleman, about 10 years ago, I stopped doing that because of safety reasons, just the risk gets too high. And, um, you know, I'm 70 years old now. So at 60, I quit, you know, solo hunting, uh, the mountains. So, you know, those are my two cents worth on it. And, you know, I, I'm looking here and looking your bio, um, you know, folks, here's, here's what I like to do. If you, you want to hear more from Matt, uh, send me the email at whitetailrendezvous.com uh, and if, Specifically, if you're planning to hunt the West in 2017, could be Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, but you're going to DIY archery hunting for elk. And if you reach out to me at whitetailrendezvous at gmail.com, and if we get enough people, um, I'll do a webinar um, with Matt and we'll just, you know, we'll have a special webinar. We're doing on a Friday or whenever we can get it scheduled. And that, that's all Matt's going to talk about and it'll be interactive. So you can ask questions and stuff. If you're interested in that, just get a hold of me again at whitetail rendezvous, um, at gmail.com. So, um, I forgot my friends at treason when I was giving earlier shout outs, um, treason camo, Cobb Sanders, Tina Kane, uh, Mike Pierce and the crew, the treason tribe. Um, you guys are doing a great job and, and you got a great brand going. So saying that, Matt, it's your time to give some shout outs and then we're going to wrap this show. Uh, I can't say enough for, uh, uh, XL mountain gear, Steve and Lenny and Mark, you know, hooking us up with some packs. We've got so much more confidence going in this next year. We're planning on going farther in than we did last year because we got some better gear. Uh, 
and of course a good partner this year my hunt partner isaac he's up next year uh he's up first uh we're gonna try to get him a big old bull um and that's our goal this year um so yep give give definitely look up xl mountain gear and give them a look at their website give them a shout well, Matt Gray, on behalf of thousands of listeners across North America, whitetail hunters and elk hunters and all hunters, men and women, kids combined, uh, you've, given, you've given us some really great insight and you've done something that a lot of people um, just frankly don't do. Um, I had on my first elk on it, I had one shot and um, we've already talked about that. I get a caddis. Um, I get some elk hair for a caddis fly out of the deal. <laughs> but other than that, you know, it, it it's just been great. And, and I can't wait to have you on again. And hopefully people will say, hey, I'd love to do a, a, a webinar with Matt. So saying that, sir, thank you so much. And I, I can't wait to hear your story about 2017 in the Colorado Rockies. Yeah, we can't wait for it. We got mountain fever. We're going to find the next episode of Whitetail Rendezvous very interesting. We're going to connect with Dave Marsh, who's a master guide and outfitter up in Alaska on a concession called Big Game, Big Country. But even more interesting, he's from Kentucky. He hunts whitetails down there, and, and he's going to talk about why whitetails in Kentucky are uh, being a very sought-after uh, game at this time of year. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.